thunder of jets in an open sky, a streak of gray, and a cheerful... Ah! A loop, a whirl, and a vertical climb, and once again, you'll know it's time for the adventures of... Rocky and Bullwinkle, and friends. Starring that supersonic speedster, Rocket J. Squirrel, with his pal, Bullwinkle the Moose, and a host of others. Bullwinkle, the show's about to start. I'm coming as fast as I can. Wave to the people. Yay! Now what are you doing? Sign an autograph. The thief, John Smith. But your name is Bullwinkle. I know, but that's hard to spell. Sure, there's always room for one more. Last time you remember, Rocky and Bullwinkle were shot high into the air in an elevator car. That's funny. I could have swore I pushed the down button. Higher than the clouds, they soared, then suddenly began to fall, faster and faster. <laughs> Meanwhile, 10,000 feet below, a huge truck roared through the countryside, piloted by the box top badman himself, Hemlock Soames, alias Boris Badanov, and his confederate, Natasha Fatal. Boris, darling, your plan worked. Moose and Squirrel are out of the way at last. You said it, Guido. If all went well, they should be in orbit by now. But far from being in orbit, Rocky and Bullwinkle were approaching the Earth much, much too fast for comfort. Well, I guess this is it, old pal. It sure is. What? The end. Ooh. It's been swell knowing you, Bullwinkle. It has, hasn't it? Well, let's not say anything more about the terrible fix we're in. Let's talk about something else. Anything you say, Rock. Sure is cold, isn't it? Yeah, looks like an early fall. Bullwinkle! Oh, sorry, Rock. We had a good show while it lasted, though. Yeah, it was a big hit. Please! I meant we were a smash. That's even worse. We gotta change the subject. But, Rock, I'm talking about every day down to oh, Earth. Oh, never mind. I just hope they catch that Hemlock Soames fella. Well, at that moment, fiduciary Blurt, the chairman of the World Economic Council, was on the phone trying to do just that. No, no, officer, in a big truck headed west. No, West, that's right. And what did you say was in the trunk? Not trunk, truck, and it's full of counterfeit box tops. Box tops? No box tops. Uh, could you spell it, please? B-O-X-T-O-P-S. B-O-S. X-X, B-O-X. Mm -hmm. One more question. Yes? How do you make a B? Eventually, though, fiduciary managed to alert the state police, and they started after Boris and Natasha. Listen, Boris. What's that sound? It's not the song of the open road, sweetheart. Look, quick, we're being followed. Yes, darling, but not very much. They're too late anyway. Look, another side of river is state line. Once we cross King's X, they couldn't catch us. You mean... Yes, nobody could possibly stop us now. But at that moment, a little way upstream, a huge object hurtled from the sky and plunged into the water. Yes, it was the elevator car containing our heroes. In a little while, it bobbed to the surface and Rocky and Bullwinkle peered fearfully out of the top of it. Is it all over, Rock? I guess so. I didn't think it'd be like this. What one? Heaven, of course. How come it's so, so soggy? This isn't heaven, Bullwinkle. It isn't? No. In that case, how come it's so cool? Bullwinkle, we landed in the river. Oh. And we're drifting downstream pretty fast. Sure enough, the floating elevator carried our boys nearer and nearer to the bridge just as Boris and Natasha started across. The huge truck rumbled forward, then in the middle of the bridge, pulled to a halt. Boris, why we're stopping? Use your little red-rimmed eyes, Natasha. The drawbridge is up. Must be boat coming. Also, is police coming? Raskolnikov of all the times for boat to go by. What kind nitwit would go boating at night? Thanks a bushel there, neighbor! Boris is moose and squirrel. Boris! Boris, speak to me, say something. I wonder if things like this happen to honest people. They certainly do, for at that moment our heroes were heading swiftly down the river and out to sea. Bullwinkle, we're 
we're heading swiftly down the river and out to sea. Okay, I heard the man. Well, now what? You'll find out next time in Fools Afloat or All the Drips at Sea. Once upon a time in a city far away lived a kindly old woodcarver named Geppetto. His workshop was in the poorer section of town. It was very tiny, and his only tool was a crude jackknife. Boy, this whittling sure gets to be a drag. Look at me talking to a pine topper dummy. Oh, if you was only a real kid. I could get your paper out somewhere. Take it easy for a while. Kindly old Geppetto had no sooner shuffled off to bed than a good fairy mysteriously appeared. Ooh. Oh, kindly old Geppetto, he's so lonely. I shall grant his wish and give this puppet life. Hey, what happened? Who are you? I'm the good fairy and I've just brought you to life. You're kidding. No. But look at me, I'm still wood. I want to be a real boy. You shall be. But first, you must do a brave deed. I knew there was a catch in it. Now you must tell kindly old Geppetto the good news. And the good fairy disappeared as mysteriously as she had come. <laughs> Pinocchio hurried to Geppetto's room. Hey, kindly old Geppetto, wake up! Hmm? Now, what have you selling the kid I don't want? But I'm the puppet you carved. The good fairy brought me to life. You kidding? No. If you're a puppet, where's your strings? Get out of here. But it's true, kindly old Geppetto. See for yourself. Ouch! When kindly old Geppetto finally realized that it really was true, he was overjoyed. Oh, boy, hot the puppies and also yippee. You're happy because you won't be lonely anymore? No, I'm happy because I'm not going to be poor anymore. A talking a puppet with no strings is worth a fortune. <laughs> I'm going to call you Pinocchio, start my own television show. Pinocchio? Why Pinocchio? It's a catchy. But I don't want to be on television. I want to do a brave deed and become a real boy. You out of your mind? Stay wood, boy, stay wood. You're going to be the biggest of things since a hunch and juicy. That's Punch and Judy, and I... You stick with me, Splinters. We're going to straight to the top. Sure enough. First thing next morning, they were in the office of J. Quincy Flogg, president of the television network. I'll have to admit, it's something you don't see every day. I thought we could put him on coast to coast to call it the Pinocchio Duty Show. Catchy, huh? Kindly, old Geppetto, I'll give you a million dollars a week, okay? Not uh... so fast. I also gotta have two coffee breaks every day. All right, you got a deal. But father! Stay wood! After the contract was signed, there were a thousand things to do. Costume fitting. You are gonna be the greatest to hit since lunch in your hoodie. Punch and Judy. So what I say. There were countless loose ends to tie together. But father, can I be a real boy? What's the matter? You got a sawdust for brains? Stay wood, boy, stay wood. And, of course, there were rehearsals. Okay, run it through the commercial again, Pinoc. But kindly, old Geppetto, I've already done it 50 times. Hey, you kid. You know what this is? It's paper. That's all right. You know what it's made of? Wood. That's all right again. Now, you want to wind up as a big brown roll in a butcher shop? No, sir. Okay, let's have the softest smile and a hard sell. Then, at last, all was in readiness. The night of the big show had arrived. Kindly, old Geppetto. Are you sure I'll be the best thing since Punch and Judy? Who are they? Skip it. Stand by. 30 seconds. Now, don't be nervous, little knothead. We got idiot cards all over the place. Idiot cards? Sure. These are cards right here. They got everything you gotta say printed on them. Somebody's gonna hold them up behind the cameras. All you gotta do is read them. But I know my part, Carney old Geppetto. I won't need them. What? Not use idiot cards? Oh. The TV star not using idiot cards? Why, that's the bravest thing I've ever heard. And with just the thought of such a brave deed as that, Pinocchio instantly turned into a real boy. I made it. I'm real. Come on. On with the show. What the show? Sure enough. Because Pinocchio was no longer a living puppet, the big show was dropped rather hard. And Pinocchio and kindly old Geppetto found themselves penniless in the street. I told you, stay wood. Just then, the good fairy appeared again. 
See, kindly old Geppetto? Pinocchio has become a real boy. Now he can be your son and live with you forever. What for? So you won't be lonely. You offer you chump lady? I want to be lonely. I don't like kids. But you must. What about the happy ending? You stick around and see how it comes out, huh? I'm a leaving. Father, come back. Never mind, Pinocchio. Let him go. You see, he isn't your father at all. He isn't? No. There is your father. Father. Pinocchio was overjoyed to really find his daddy at last. And what about kindly old Geppetto? Well, he hid away where nobody would ever think of looking for him and went back to wood carving. For he figured that if he kept carving puppets, someday he might make another one that could talk. Heads up for you guys. I give an ice cream cone to the first to one that says, ouch. Today's lecture is entitled, Magic Made Easy, the Hard Way. There are six basic tricks, the first of which is the trickiest, namely, pulling a rabbit out of a hat. This looks familiar. Nothing up my sleeve. Presto! The more I try this, the further away I get. One of the most popular tricks, and least requested, I might add, is sawing a man in half. Here's your saw, Mr. Know-it-all. Thank you. Here we go. <laughs> Ta-da! Now I ask you, ladies and gentlemen, wouldn't you swear this man was cut in half? Go ahead, sir. Walk off the stage. Both halves, both halves. <laughs> And now for the most difficult trick of all, the living pincushion. Step inside the box, Rock. What are you going to do? You see these swords? Once you're inside, I shall pierce the box. And me too? Well, we hope not. Well, I'm not going in there. Very well. Then I shall call upon the services of my pet Jersey. Bossy, take your place in the box. <coughs> there. Now Bossy and I will astound you. Taking the swords, I plunge them into every section of the box. Into the bottom, the top, the sides. <laughs> sword after sword. Now you will see that although the box is perforated with swords, Bossy is untouched. Take a look inside, Rock. I'm not going to look in there. All righty, I shall look myself. Now there you see. Holy cow! And now it's time... Time for that jolly juggler, Bullwinkle. Oh, dear. Three at once. One, two... And now here's a feature you're sure to like. Three. Body and Sherman here. Tell me, Sherman, do you know what P.T. Barnum was famous for? P.T. Boats, Mr. Peabody? Uh, no, Sherman. P.T. Barnum was an impresario. A what? Perhaps it can best be explained with the Wayback Machine set up for 1871, Sherman. Mm, good boy. And our destination will be New York City, where we'll visit the greatest show on Earth, P.T. Barnum's Circus. In its own inimitable fashion, the Wayback escorted Sherman and me into the main tent, and there, supervising the rehearsal for opening night, was P.T. Barnum himself. You understand, Freddy? When you dive off that platform, make it look like you're scared. I am scared, P.T. Well, don't be. Just aim for the tank and don't worry. All right, let her go. What a dive! Flawless execution, Mr. Barnum. Flawless. Yes, but it would have been better if there'd been water in the tank. Sure enough, a gaping hole in the tank's floor proved that Freddy the high diver had gone on to bigger things. Oh, at this rate, the show will never open tonight. And if it doesn't? Then I'm out as half owner. My partners get full control. That's them up there, pied and sick, world's greatest flying trapeze artists. Nice work you did draining that tank, sick. Nothing to it, Hyde. I think Barnum's ready to quit. <laughs> he will be after the Lion Act. Yeah. Will he remember the main? Get it, Hyde? <laughs>
Mane? Lion's mane? <laughs> oh, but you're sick, sick. While the rehearsal continued, Sherman and I went about an investigation. It was inside Hyde and Six Tent that we came across some rather interesting evidence. Look, Mr. Peabody, they've been using a picture of Mr. Barnum for a dartboard. Hmm. 45 points. Poor shots. And look at this funny-looking doll. That, Sherman, is a voodoo doll. It's just like Mr. Barnum. Yes, and you'll notice in this instance the aim was much better. We delivered the evidence just before the show began. So, hide and sick are behind this. Without the slightest doubt. Shall I fetch the police, Mr. Barnum? Not yet, Sonny. Hide and sick are my star attractions. If they don't perform, the show closes. And then legally the show will become theirs. Yes. Hear that, Hyde? All we gotta do is not perform, and Barnum is out on his ear. Then leave us not move one muscle, sick. Not one teensy weensy muscle. Ladies and gentlemen, presenting those fantastic flying artists of the high trapeze, two of the most talented crooks in show business, Hyde and Sick. They're not moving, Mr. Peabody. They won't go into their act. Really? We'll see about that. We got it made, Sick. Them dopes can applaud all they want, but there ain't nothing that'll make us move. How do you do, gentlemen? My name is Peabody, and this is a friend of P.T. Barnum's. A skunk! Let me out of here! Well, that was all it took. Hide and Sick launched themselves into a memorable aerial display. Of course, they had high hopes of escaping, but I had instructed Sherman to block any attempts with a blowtorch. Ah! And so, back and forth, they swung between Scylla and Charybdis, as it were, and by morning, they were still at it, albeit a trifle weary. I know I should turn them over to the police, but I just can't do it. That was the greatest flying trapeze act I ever saw. But you can't let them go without punishment. Sherman is right, you know. Well, Barnum Circus flourished and Hyde and Sick became his biggest stars. As for the punishment, each afternoon at three, Jumbo, the elephant, put a well-known expression to good use. A tanning one's hide. Now I'm sick. Sick. seems that Boris Badenov's getaway scheme has backfired. But when he tried to drive a truck full of counterfeit box tops over the state line, he was halted by an open drawbridge. Thank the bushel, Mabel! Natasha, is that miserable moose and squirrel? I... Now, I... now, Boris, watch your language. Oh, purity. Boris, please. Innocence, honor, virtue. Boris, there is a lady present. I can't help it, Natasha. When I get mad, I'm liable to say anything. We better go, darling. Or would you rather stay here and entertain the guests? But we can't leave truck here. What will central control say? I don't know. But if we're arrested, I know what judge will say. What's that? Twenty years. <laughs> you forget I'm professional villain. You think I would run away, desert my post? Yes. <laughs> You're right. Let's go. And the two fugitives leaped over the side of the bridge just as the police arrived on the scene. That's the truck, Captain. Yeah, but those crooks got clean away. No, not quite clean, for on a girder under the bridge, dirty and disheveled, huddled Boris and Natasha. Meanwhile, our heroes, still afloat in a runaway elevator car, were drifting nearer and nearer the open sea. This looks like real trouble, Bullwinkle. Good, I hate that make-believe kind. Yeah, but we're drifting out to sea. Who knows where we'll wind up? That is bad. Sure. Because we didn't send a change of address card to the post office. But though our heroes didn't know it, they were under observation at that very moment from a Coast Guard station at the mouth of the river. What do you make of it, Carruthers? I, I don't know, Commodore. I've never seen a craft like that before. Let me see. Uh-oh. Carruthers, you fool! That's a submarine! Submarine? Certainly! Look at that silhouette. 
It's just like this one, see? That's a conning tower. But what's that on the top, sir? That thing that looks like antlers. Antlers? Carruthers, you've been on the beach too long. That's their radar antenna. But, but, sir... Gunnery division, target bearing 250. Prepare to fire. Bearing 250. 250. And the muscles of an enormous shore battery swung ponderously toward our heroes and their makeshift vessel. Bullwinkle, they're on the shore. It's an American flag. I'm already standing at attention, bro. No, no, that must be a Coast Guard station. Hey, ahoy! It is us, Rocky Squirrel and Bullwinkle Moose. Fire! It's us, Rocky and Bullwinkle. I wonder why they're shooting at us. Must be from a rival network. Well, they missed us twice. Yeah, well, third time's the charm. And Bullwinkle was all too right, for the next shell was right on target. Bullwinkle, we're sinking. You have certainly confirmed my suspicions, Rock. Hey, help! Looks like he's sinking, Commodore. Nonsense, Carruthers. He's merely submerging. Get a sub-chaser out there and depth bomb him right away. And a moment later, a fast vessel shot through the water toward our heroes. They must have seen us, Rock. They're sending out a boat to pick us up. It's going awful fast for a pickup boat, Bullwinkle. Yes, the sub-chaser roared right past our friends, and as it did, fired two huge depth charges from its stern. I wonder what those cans are. Well, this is a heck of a time to be putting out the garbage. The two charges sank beneath the river, and then as our heroes floated over them, went off with a roar. Well, is this the soggy finish of the whole ugly mess? Be sure to be with us next time for Water on the Brain or The Deep Six and Seven Eights. Well, it looks as if our time has just about run out. Just enough left to tell him who the sponsor was. You got the credits, Bullwinkle? All on this itty bitty card. Oop.